so Ann can get the camera set. And so let me welcome everyone tonight. I'm glad you're with me. I'm going to encourage you to turn to Luke 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 14 in just a moment. I really would encourage you to write these verses down. I'm going to be reading many of them, but you may want to go back and have them for your own notes. Luke 11, beginning in verse 14. Now, I've entitled this teaching, The Finger of of God, the finger of God. Now, in just a moment, you'll understand why I have titled this series that. Let's pray. Father, I am asking at the beginning of this series that your blessing would be with us. Father, that we would understand the authority that we as the Christian church have over the dark world, over the evil forces that we battle against and battle against our nation and our lives, Father. Uh, remind us of these truths again in Jesus name amen I'm gonna read these verses out of the New Living Translation they just kind of bring it home a little better than some of the other translations that I found I'm, I'm real partial to the New Living Translation but Luke 11 beginning in verse 14 it says one day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak and when the demon was gone the man began to speak the crowds were amazed, but some of them said, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Others, trying to test Jesus, demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. He knew their thoughts, so he said, and I, I hope we'll all listen to this, Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. I pray We'll wake up in America and realize that if we don't stop this civil war that's going on in our nation, uh, we're, we're going to be a doomed nation. So listen to this. He says, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Boy, I've seen that happen before. You say I am powered by Satan, but if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can his kingdom survive? And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your exorcist? They cast out demons, too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. Verse 20, listen carefully. But if I am casting out demons by the power of God, the Greek there really should read, if I'm casting out demons by the finger of God, thus the title, then the kingdom of God has ar arrived among you. For when a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe. Until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons, and carries off his belongings. Listen to this. This is an interesting statement. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. I mean, you know, there's no middle ground. You're either with God or you're not. He says, anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. You know, we can just kind of be floating along in neutral gear. He says, if you're not working with me, you're working against me. Now listen carefully, it says, when an evil, or the Greek word there is when an unclean spirit. Think about how spirits that inhabit people, how they make them unclean and the unclean things that they uh, encourage people to do. It says, when an evil or an unclean spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from so it returns and finds that its former home is all swept and in order. Now, folks, I want you to catch something. God can clear our house of evil. He can get those things out of our house. In other words, our house can be swept clean. But if we don't fill that house with God's spirit, with God's word, with God's presence, with fellowship among believers, he says, then this spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. Folks, demonic spirits are always looking for human habitation. Now, I know that freaks us out, but it's true. You know why? It is the only way demons can fully manifest themselves or express themselves in the earth. They have to have human expression to do so. And so, that's the reason he said, listen, if a spirit is cast out, man, when he has access to come back he says come on guys let's go and he brings seven other spirits more evil than himself and they all enter the person and live there and so that person is worse off than before as he was speaking a woman in the crowd called out god bless your mother 
womb from which you came and the breast that nursed you? And Jesus replied, but even more blessed are those who hear the words of God, listen now, and put them into practice. Now listen to the context here. Blessed are those who hear the word of God, but put it into practice. The context is that of dealing with demonic spirits. So I've titled this series, The Finger of God, with the words from the very lips of Jesus where he is confronting the Pharisees' resistance to his deliverance ministry. That's what they were doing. They were resisting him. A lot of people resist the deliverance movement. And later in this series, I'm going to tell you why they do that. I think you're, the light's going to go, kind of go off and you're going to say, wow, that's probably true and that's why people do it. But folks, let me tell you, if we're going to have revival, if we're going to deal with the devil, we're going to have the kind of revival Jesus had. How many of you know everywhere Jesus went, there was revival? I mean, you know, how I many you know the first century church had it? But folks, they weren't afraid. They didn't back down from the demonic. They didn't uh, let the demons silence them. They dealt with them. And they cast them out when necessary. And they dealt with that. And they taught people how when they were delivered of demons. I know we don't like to think humans can be have demon habit, hab, hab, habitation. But we can. Thank God. This will shock some of you. That when I got saved, I, I wasn't... I, I, once you're saved, you cannot be possessed by a demon, but you sure can be oppressed and you can be inflicted by demons, folks. Because I can tell you, I was. Thank God. He knew that when I was born again, He took me to a spirit filled, Holy Ghost, real church where they could deal with these things in my life. Had they not, I'd probably be back doing what I was doing and worse and probably dead by now. But thank God for a group of people. There's some of you in that very church that I went to, it was in Mineola, Texas. And I'll never forget one night when God decided, well, this is the night we're going to deal with some of this. And I won't give you all the details, but folks, listen. Demon spirits can oppress Christians. They can oppress people. And we've got to get back to the understanding that we've got to deal with these things. Now, with that said, I want to make several very important comments. Here's one of them. Not every bad thing that happens is because of a demon. Now, we're not going to get so conscious of demons that we forget about God, but not every bad thing that happens is because of a demon. And just because someone becomes sick or ill, it does not necessarily mean it's because of a demon. Now, it can. Demons can inflict sickness on people. But we inflict it on ourselves, too. How I many of you know that we can do that by poor diet, lack of exercise, a lot of other things? So not every sickness is, is a demon. The devil and demons are not all powerful. And they are not stronger than God or the Holy Spirit or, in fact, the church. In fact, there is no comparison whatsoever. It's not like, well, God wins one day. You know, he gets in the, the right punch. And, and then the next day the devil gets in the, the right punch. And one day the devil knocks you down. Then God, it, Folks, this is not even, e there's no equal here. The church just sometimes just doesn't. We've got to be reminded. We just forget who we are. And the authority we have, and we, and we start doing life, and we get beat down with life, and we just kind of let, you know, okay, sera, sera, whatever happens, let it be. And it's one of the reasons I really believe the devil and demons are able to accomplish so much of what they accomplish today is because we don't understand who we are. And that's what this series is about. It is to remind us of our authority. In fact, I want to read to you again the Great Commission found in Matthew 28. Beginning in verse 18, and I'll read all the way through verse 20. This is, this is the Great Commission. This is Jesus' final words to his believers. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, Here's what he said to them. Listen. All authority has been given to me, listen now, in heaven and on earth. Let me say that again. Jesus came and he spoke to them. What did he say? He says, All authority. All authority, not a little bit, not sort of, kind of, maybe. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Verse 19, he says, go therefore. He said, you are now to go. I've got the authority. I'm now giving it to you, and you are to go, and you're to represent me. He says, you're to go and make disciples. What, what should you and I be doing every day of our life? Sure, we're dealing with life. We've got to, got to go to the doctor, got to go buy groceries, got to keep gas in our car. But all along the way, we're to be looking for people. 
What else are we to be doing? We're to be making disciples. Every believer is called to be making disciples. If you're not making disciples, you need to be praying that God brings someone into your life that you can disciple. And if you don't have someone to disciple, I'll give you a few. We need to be making disciples. And what does he say? We're to go, therefore, because we've got the authority, and we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then verse 20 says, we're to teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. So, folks, this, this commission is what we're to be doing. And the reason we can do this is because God has given us his authority. Amen? That's why we can do these things. We've got his authority. He's given it to us. Listen to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. I'll give you just a moment. Maybe some of you are turning there. Maybe some of you are working your little device there. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. I'll begin reading. It says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? I love Peter. Listen to Peter. Simon, he, 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 he came forth and it says, Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. How can people pick on Peter? Peter had a revelation that none of the others had. He, Peter, my man, he understood what not everybody understood. He said, why, you're, you're the son of God. You're the living God. You're the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for f flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter, listen, quit picking on Peter. Peter was in tune with God more than you realize. Besides, he's going to meet you at the pearly gates when you get there. <laughs> Verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Did you hear what I said? And the gates of hell, better yet, did you hear what Jesus said? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse, actually, the church is to be prevailing against the devil. Pushing on the devil. Verse 19 says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, heaven's going to back it up. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heaven's backing us up. Why? Because God has given us his authority. So we've been given absolute authority over demonic spirits and over the kingdom of darkness. Now Ephesians chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, I want to read some things here about how that God has made Jesus uh, head of the church. I believe these are the verses. I'll go ahead and start reading them. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 15, it says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. Listen now what Paul did. He said, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you grow in the knowledge of God. Here he is again. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Listen to him again. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. Listen now, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now listen very carefully. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Where's Christ? He's far above it all right now, folks. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ, listen very carefully, and he has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. He's the head over all things. He's above it all. 
And why has he done that? For the benefit of the church. He is the head of the church. We are the body of Christ. We are connected to him. Therefore, he's above it all. Guess what? There's another verse in Ephesians that says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Folks, that's a place of authority. Amen? So when you get up in the morning and the devil's there speaking to you, trying to cause you to have a bad day or interrupt your life and bring about some really bad circumstances, if you discern that's where it's coming from, you need to bind it. You know, every now and then, if I'm really listening to God, and I'll just kind of be on the advance. I'll, I'll be on the, uh, I'll, I'll be proactive. I'll be moving out in front. For example, I, I could just sense the devil's going to try to stir up some things today. I just said, in the name of Jesus, I bind it right now. I bind every infliction of the devil. I bind every interference of the devil. I bind him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit impressed, you might as well do that now. Cancel this thing out now before it even gets started. We're connected to Christ. He's above it all. And he's given us his authority, and we are his representatives on the earth. So let me read it again. It says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Now, I know we get focused on what's going on in our lives and in our world, but listen, Christ is in it too. Amen? You believe, you believe Jesus is still in America? He's, he's all through America. Let me tell you, if it wasn't for the church, and you think there's some bad things going on now, we'd really see some tough times. So we can see that God has given us all authority. We have all the authority that we need to get the job done. So we can't, in our mind, think big devil, little God. We've got to think big God, little devil. He is defeated. In fact, I want to read something to you in a moment. But let me ask you a question first. Where did the devil and demons come from? Now, I know some of you know this. But some of you may not. Maybe you don't understand this. And I want everybody to clearly understand where the devil came from. In Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Let me, let me read it to you. And I'm going to be reading these verses out of the New King James Version. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I want to read to you the five I wills where Satan or Lucifer exerted his will against God's will and it got him in trouble. And folks, let me just tell you, it'll get any of us in trouble if we try to exert our will against God's will. You know, sometimes we think it's the devil we're fighting against. Sometimes it's our will. We're trying to exert our will against God's will. Folks, listen, God has never lost a battle, and he's not going to lose one with me or you. You know, we can go brat on God, demand our way, but guess what? He'll just look at you like, boy, you better watch it. Here's what Satan said. He said, I will ascend. Notice, I will in, I ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. How many of you know we're not serving God? That's basically what we're doing. We're exerting our own will. We don't serve God. We're saying, I can handle this, God. I'll do this on my own. Notice what he says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you. Listen, on the day that we see the devil for who he really was, we're, we're actually going to be in a state of shock. The world is going to be in a shock, and here's what they're going to say. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? who did not open the house of his prisoners. In other words, this is not the, re, the, the, the one. This, this, there is no way that this is the one that I spent endless nights worrying about and, and being afraid of and fearful of. And this, this is not the one that tried to destroy America. Surely, surely this is not the one. When we see the devil for who he is, the defeated demonic spirit, that he is, and all his legions that follow him, we will be in utter amazement. 
I think we're going to have an eye-opening experience. So why don't we have it now? So where did the devil and demons come from? Well, at one point in time, they were in heaven. And they were cast out of heaven, according to verse 12. We get a little more insight in Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 11. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Let me begin reading. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him. Now, some will question when you say, Okay, you're about to tell me he's going to address the devil, but it sounds like to me he is addressing the king of Tyre. Well, he is. But how many of you know behind every ruler there is a ruling spirit? And what he's about to do here, uh, this prophet, the Son of Man, is about to identify the devil behind this ruler, the king of Tyre. Folks, how many of you know that? Rulers have spirits behind them. If they don't have the spirit of God behind them, let me tell you, they've got a demonic spirit behind them. Would you say you've known of some leaders who are alive today that are being influenced by demonic spirits? And so what is he doing? He's addressing the spirit behind the king of Tyre, which is none other than the devil. And so he begins to prophesy. Thus says the Lord God. He's talking about the devil. And you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of Eden. Satan was there. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, uh, the diamond, the beryl, onyx. And jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Lucifer was a good-looking dude. Well, he actually was a good-looking angel. He wasn't a dude. I mean, he was impressive. And it goes on to say, The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared before you on the day you were created. How I many of you know, many believe, many theologians believe that Lucifer... Uh, was the worship leader in heaven before he got dethroned and got kicked out. I think that's the reason he fights against worship so hard, Steve and Lorraine. Why he's always trying to discourage worship leaders, trying to discourage people in worship. Oh, why don't you stay home? You don't want to go. Well, that's probably the time you need to come the most. Because he understands the power of worship. When we worship, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to worry about demons being around. They're not around, and if they do, if they are around, they're going to manifest, and then all you got to do is just cast them out, right? And so he hates worship. He had these pipes and timbrels uh, uh, built into him. He says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created the devil was created. Lucifer was created by God himself. But he says, uh, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So Lucifer sinned. He allowed iniquity in his heart. He, he, How did he do it? He started exerting his will against God's will. He says, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane, a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. In other words, pride caused him to say these things and exert his will against God. He says, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you down to the ground and I laid you before kings that they may, might gaze on you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. And all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So Lucifer, Lucifer's day is coming. But he still thinks he may win this thing, but he won't. So when did Lucifer or Satan fall? Let me, let me, just, let me just say a few things. Any answer I give you when it happened uh, is, is only speculation. Now hear me out. 
Because I've heard all the thoughts people have, and here's what the devil wants us to do. Y'all get caught up on when I actually fail, and don't focus on the fact that I actually fail. Y'all, y'all get all religious and try to really, you know, get tense with one another about uh, when it actually happened. Now, verse 13 says you were in the uh, Eden, in, in the Garden of Eden. Now, I'll just tell you what a few people believe. That Genesis, in chapter 1, don't amen because I may say something you don't agree with in just a moment. Verses 1 and 2 between that, that they believe that gives us insight into when Satan actually fell, when God cast him to the earth. But listen, I, I, I hate to, mm, I could blow that thing to smithereens, but I'm not going to do that. But here's the point. We, we could speculate about it. Maybe it's interesting to talk about. But uh, it's only speculation. Now, I, I, I tell people this from time to time. Where God's word is silent, I'm silent. It really doesn't matter when it happened. That's not important. But the important truth is that it did happen and that humanity is affected by this event every single day. Are y'all hearing me? I don't want to hear any of you arguing with one or say, well, I heard what pastor said, but, but, it doesn't matter. But it does matter that we understand that he did fall and it is affecting this world to this very day. In fact, Jesus himself confirms that this event did occur uh, did occur in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Listen to this. This is when Jesus had sent his uh, disciples out. He had now raised up another group of 70, and he had sent them out. And it says in verse 17, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, Affirming what I've been teaching you here, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. But listen, Jesus says, but let me give you some perspective here. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Those are all symbolic symbols of the devil. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. He's saying, stay focused. Don't be afraid. Use the authority that I've got. Nevertheless, he goes on, do not, he says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know, you can, you can get off on some of these, these things. I mean, people get so off into deliverance and stuff, you almost wonder if they remember Jesus anymore. It's just to be a part of who we are as we go about our life. And we have this authority, and he says, use it. Don't get all excited about the fact that demons are subject to you. Folks, some of you are going to get so filled up with God one day. Uh, you're going to, all of a sudden, a demon's going to manifest around you, and you're going to wonder, what's going on? Well, it's a demon. It's a demon. And we've got to deal with them. But what do we do? We, use, oh, we freak out. Here's another important fact. I want to read to you from Revelation 12, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 12, verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, uh, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. Verse 4, listen now. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. These are, these are angels that Satan manipulated into following him. He drew a third of them with him, it says, and, and he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Uh, the story is here, it's, he, he's, he's giving prophetic utterance to the fact that Jesus was going to be born and Satan was there to try to devour the birth of the child. It says to devour her child as soon as it was born. But we don't know how it happened. But Satan was able to convince one-third of the angels of God to follow him in his destructive path. You know, there again, people go, ooh, scary. By the way, 
I had a little, I guess you'd call it a little understanding from the Lord. I, I tell you, we were, Tracy and I were taking our little morning walk, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me, and I know it was a Holy Spirit thought. The devil cr has created horror movies and scary movies and all these things that we see that just freak us out to convince us that he is, he is just this awesome, scary, mean dude. If you are watching horror movers, uh, movies, cease and desist. Because I guarantee you, if you're watching that and you're getting all freaked out by it, you're not exercising authority in the Lord. He's not all big and bad. He goes about as a roaring lion. We just had time to talk to you about the old roaring lion. How many of you know the roaring lion is not the one who does all the, all the killing of the prey for the, 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 the group to have a meal? He just does the roaring. It's those female lions that are fierce and they're out there. They're the ones that kill the prey. The lion just roars. He can't really do much. In fact, he's not that agile. And so the devil goes about as a roaring lion through scary movies, horror movies, to just freak us out. I will never forget when I was about 15 years old, I went to California to visit my favorite uncle. He was always showing us a good time. He always had fast cars, and he just knew how to have, he didn't have any children. So uh, when he was around, man, it was, it was fun. We, 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 we had some good times. And, but I went to visit him. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I could have gone to Europe and toured Europe for about two or three weeks, but I was a stupid 15-year-old and didn't take the advantage of that, and I went to be with my uncle. And while we were there, we went to the movie theater and saw The Exorcist. The Exorcist. It freaked me out. I couldn't sleep for two weeks. And I had to have every light on. And, of course, I was there, and I didn't want to act like a scaredy cat. But, man, I slept with the light on for the remainder of my time in California because I was scared. And I stayed freaked out about that. that I, anyway, I'm not going to give you the details. It, I'm not even going to ask you all to see that movie, but I'm just telling you it did a number on me. It scared me. The devil is not as big and bad as we think he is. He does things like that to exalt himself. Right? So, these angels that have fallen, this is where much of man's struggle is today. It's against these demonic forces. And what have they done? They have aligned themselves against mankind. Now again, let me read Ephesians 6 to you. And again, I know for some of you this is pretty basic. Some of you this may be new to, but I just want to make sure that we, we lay a good solid foundation as we get into this teaching. But Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 13, it says, Finally, my brethren... Paul's wrapping up his letter to the Ephesians. He says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not your might, His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Notice he says we wrestle against them. He doesn't say they defeat us and they win over us. We wrestle against them. But we win. If we stay spiritually fit and we keep on our armor, we always win. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, let me just kind of wrap all this up. Let me conclude with this. Number one, there are more angels with us than demons against us. You got to understand that. Only one-third followed Lucifer. And Jesus has defeated them and stripped them of their authority. They can only exercise what authority they're given or allowed to exercise. Number two, God is all-powerful. Satan is absolutely no match for God and the church. Number three, the church has been granted all the power it will ever need to conquer all demonic powers. How many of you believe the church has that that authority right here in Wood County. We do. How many of you believe that mom and dad over your children? You have authority over them. When you see the devil, you just, man, you just say, boy, this doesn't make sense. You know why it doesn't make sense? Because it's demonic. And don't put up with it. 
Cast those devils out. Bind them from your kids, and especially as school is getting ready to start. Every parent, every grandparent, start praying over those kids and bind the devil from them from this uh, year. Amen? Luke 10 and 19 says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't ever be afraid to stand up to the devil. And, and I just had this thought. Someone thought, well, I hear you, Pastor, but I'm not perfect in the Lord, yet I still have some problems. Well, join the club. Don't let that keep you. If, if, it, if, if your authority was based upon perfection, none of us would ever make it this side of heaven. So just exercise your authority and use the authority of God. And if God's telling you, okay, you got a little error in your life, it's, it's how Satan's getting in your life, stop it. Put a stop to it. Bind it in your own life. Amen? And number four, we win. I've read the end of the book. We win. We win. And sooner than we can imagine, I want to read 11, uh, Revelation uh, 20, verse 10. It says, the devil who deceived them. This is what he has to look forward to. And he knows this. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can. It says, he was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. I want to conclude by saying one final thing. When you hear people talk about hell and people going to hell, people choose to go to hell if they go to hell. God did not create hell for humanity. The only reason any human will end up in hell is because they reject Jesus Christ they reject the truth and they choose their own will and their own way. But when God created hell, he had one thought in mind. And that thought was, when I say it's over, the devil who deceived the world and deceived people and nations, I'm going to cast him into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they are going to be tormented there forever and forever and forever, day and night, forever. You don't want to go there. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that you've given the church all the authority that we need to go forth and carry your gospel and heal the sick and cast out devils, Lord. Father, I pray there'll just be a renewed understanding of that in, this, uh, in all of us who are hearing this, some who will see this, Lord. But we thank you that you've given us your authority. May we be bold now to use it. May we be alert in the Spirit when it's time, Father. Lord, sometimes we're just going along our day, and all of a sudden something manifests. Help us to be ready and armed to fight against that darkness because we win, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said...